chapter one here, the river and its history. The Mississippi is well worth reading about. It's not a commonplace river, but on the contrary, is in all ways remarkable. Considering the Missouri its main branch, it is the longest river in the world, 4,300 miles. It seems safe to say that it is also the crookedest river in the world, since in one part of its journey it uses up 1,300 miles to cover the same ground that the crow would fly over in 675. It discharges three times as much water as the St. Lawrence, 25 times as much as the Rhine, and 338 times as much as the Thames. No other river has so vast a drainage basin. It draws its water supply from 28 states and territories, from Delaware on the Atlantic seaboard, and from all the country between that and Idaho on the Pacific Slope, a spread of 45 degrees of longitude. The Mississippi receives and carries to the Gulf water from 54 subordinate rivers that are navigable by steamboats and some hundreds that are navigable by flats and keels. The area of its drainage basin is as great as the combined areas of England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, France, Spain, Portugal, Germany, Austria, Italy, and Turkey. And almost all of this region is fertile. The Mississippi Valley proper is exceptionally so. It is a remarkable river in this that instead of widening towards its mouth it grows narrower, grows narrower and deeper. From the junction of the Ohio to a point halfway down to the sea, the width averages a mile in high water. Thence to the sea the width steadily diminishes until at the passes above the mouth it is a little bit over a half a mile. At the junction of the Ohio and the Mississippi, the depth is 87 feet. The depth increases gradually, reaching 129 just above the mouth. The difference in rise and fall is also remarkable. Not in the upper, but in the lower. The rise is tolerably uniform down in Natchez, 360 miles above the mouth, about 50 feet. But at Bayou La Forge, the river rises only 24 feet. At New Orleans, only 15, and just above the mouth, only two and a half. An article in the New Orleans Times Democrat, based upon reports of able engineers, states that the river annually empties 406 million tons of mud into the Gulf of Mexico, which brings to mind Captain Marriott's rude name for the Mississippi, the Great Sewer. This mud, solidified, would make a mass a mile square and 241 feet high. The mud deposited gradually extends the land, but only gradually. It has extended it not quite a third of a mile in the 200 years which have elapsed since the river took its place in history. The belief of the scientific people is that the mouth used to be at Baton Rouge where the hills cease and that the 200 miles of land between there and the gulf was built by the river. This gives us an age of that piece of country without any trouble at all, 120,000 years. Yet it is much the youthfulest batch of country that lies around anywhere. The Mississippi is remarkable in still another way, its disposition to make prodigious jumps by cutting through narrow necks of land and thus straightening and shortening itself. More than once it has shortened itself 30 miles at a single jump. These cutoffs have curious effects. They have thrown several river towns out into the rural districts and built up sandbars and forests in front of them. The town of Delta used to be three miles below Vicksburg. A recent cutoff has radically changed the position. The Delta is now two miles above Vicksburg. Both of these river towns have been retired to the country by that cutoff cut off plays havoc with boundary lines and jurisdictions. For instance, a man is living in the state of Mississippi today. A cutoff occurs tonight and tomorrow the man finds himself and his land over on the other side of the river within the boundaries and subject to the laws of the state of Louisiana. 
such a thing happened in the Upper River in the old times. It could have transferred a slave from Missouri to Illinois and made a free man of him. The Mississippi does not alter its locality by cutoffs alone. It's always changing its habitat bodily. It's always moving bodily sideways. At hard times, Louisiana, the river is two miles west of the region it used to occupy. As a result, the original site of that settlement is not now in Louisiana at all, but on the other side of the river in the state of Mississippi. Nearly the whole of that 1,300 miles of old Mississippi River, which LaSalle floated down in his canoes 200 years ago, is good, solid, dry ground now. The river lies to the right of it in places and to the left of it in other places. Now, although the Mississippi's mud builds land but slowly down at the mouth, where the gulf billows interfere with its work, it builds fast enough to better protected regions up higher. For instance, Prophet Island contained 1,500 1, acres of land 30 years ago. Since then, the river has added uh, 700 acres to it. But enough of these examples of the mighty stream's eccentricities for the present. I'll give a few more of them further along in the book. Let us drop the Mississippi's physical history and say a word about its historical history, so to speak. We can glance briefly at its slumbrous first epoch in a couple of short chapters, at its second and wider awake epoch in a couple more, and at its flushest and wide awake epoch in a good many succeeding chapters, and then talk about its comparatively tranquil present epoch and what shall be left of the book. The world and the books are so accustomed to use and overuse the word new in connection with our country that we early get a permanently retain the impression that there's nothing old about it. We do of course know that there are several comparatively old dates in American history, but the mere figures convey to our minds just no idea, no distinct realization of the stretch of time which they represent. To say that DeSoto, the first white man who ever saw the Mississippi River, saw it in 1542 is a remark which states a fact without interpreting it. It is something like giving the dimensions of a sunset by astronomical measurements and cataloging the colors by their scientific names, and as a result you get the bald fact of the sunset, but you don't see the sunset. You don't it would have been better to paint a picture of it. The date 1542 standing by itself means little or nothing to us. But when one groups a few neighboring historical dates and facts around it, he adds perspective and color and then realizes that this is one of the American dates which is quite respectable for age. For instance, when the Mississippi was first seen by a white man, less than a quarter of a century had elapsed since Francis I's defeat at Pavia, the death of Raphael, the death of Bayard, sans pure and sans reproach, the driving out of the Knights Hospitallers from Rhodes by the Turks, and the placarding of the 95 Propositions, the act which began the Reformation. When De Soto took his glimpse of the river, Ignatius Loyola was an obscure name. The Order of the Jesuits was not yet a year old. Michelangelo's paint was not yet dry on the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. Mary Queen of Scots was not yet born, but would be before the year closed. Catherine de Medici was a child. Elizabeth of England was not yet in her teens. Calvin, Benvenuto, Cellini, and the Emperor Charles V we're at the top of their fame, and each was manufacturing history after his own peculiar fashion. Margaret of Navarre was writing Heptameron in some religious books. The first survives, the others are forgotten. Wit and indelicacy being sometimes better literature preservers than holiness. Lax court morals and absurd chivalry business were in full feather, and the joust and the tournament were the frequent pastime of titled gentlemen who could fight better than they could spell, while religion was the passion of the ladies and classifying their offspring in the children of 
full rank and children by brevet or pastime. In fact, all around, religion was in a peculiarly blooming condition. The Council of Trent was being called. The Spanish Inquisition was roasting and racking and burning with a free hand. Elsewhere on the continent, the nations were being persuaded to holy living by sword and fire. In England, Henry VIII had suppressed the monasteries, burnt Fisher and another bishop or two, and was getting his English Reformation and his harem effectively started. When DeSoto stood on the banks of the Mississippi, it was still two years before Luther's death, eleven years before the burning of Servetus, thirty years before St. Bartholomew's slaughter. Rabelais was not yet published, Don Quixote was not yet written, Shakespeare was not yet born. A hundred long years must elapse before Englishmen would hear the name of Oliver Cromwell. Unquestionably, the discovery of the Mississippi is a datable fact which considerably mellows and modifies the shiny newness of our country and gives her a most respectable outside aspect of rustiness and antiquity. DeSoto merely glimpsed the river, then died and was buried in it by his priests and soldiers. One would expect the priests and soldiers to multiply the river's dimensions by ten in the Spanish custom of the day, and thus move other adventurers to go at once and explore it. On the contrary, their narratives when they reached home did not excite that amount of curiosity. The Mississippi was left unvisited by whites during a term of year which seems incredible in our energetic days. One may sense the interval to, this, to his mind after fashion by dividing it up in this way. After DeSoto glimpsed the river, a fraction short of a quarter of a century elapsed, and then Shakespeare was born, lived a trifle more than half a century, then died, and when he had been in his grave considerably more than half a century, the second white man saw the Mississippi. In our day, we don't allow 130 years to elapse between glimpses of a marvel. If someone should discover a creek in the county next to the one that the North Pole is in, Europe and America would start 15 costly expeditions thither, one to explore the creek and 14 to hunt for each other. For more than 150 years, there had been white settlements on our Atlantic coast. These people were in intimate communication with the Indians. In the south, the Spaniards were robbing, slaughtering, enslaving, and converting them. Higher up, the English were trading beads and blankets to them for consideration, and throwing in civilization and whiskey for the lagnap. And in Canada, the French were schooling them in a rudimentary way, missionarying among them, and drawing whole populations of them at time to Quebec and later to Montreal to buy furs of them. Necessarily, then, these various clusters of whites must have heard of the great river of the far west, and indeed, they did hear of it vaguely, so vaguely and indefinitely that its course, proportions, and locality were hardly even guessable. The mere mysteriousness of the matter ought to fire curiosity and compelled exploration, but this did not occur. Apparently nobody happened to want such a river, nobody needed it, nobody was curious about it. And so for a century and a half the Mississippi remained out of the market and undisturbed. When DeSoto found it, he was not hunting for a river and had no present occasion for one. Consequently, he did not value it or even take any particular notice of it. But at last La Salle, the Frenchman, conceived the idea of seeking out that river and exploring it. It always happens that way when a man seizes upon a neglected and important idea, people inflamed with a notion crop up all around. It happens so in this instance. Naturally, the question suggests itself, why did these people want the river now when nobody had wanted it in the five preceding generations? Apparently, it was because at this late date, they thought they had discovered a way to make it useful. For it had come to be believed that the Mississippi emptied into the Gulf of California and therefore afforded a shortcut from Canada to China. Previously, the supposition had been that it emptied into the Atlantic or Sea of Virginia. 